Well, hello there. Jackie Holland here in Sherman, Texas. Hope you're having a blessed day, wonderful day. And this is the day the Lord has made. You know, today, 35 years ago today, later, it would be later on this afternoon, it would be 35 years that I found my firstborn son, Michael David, and he had apparently taken his own life. He was 27 years old. He was uh, a wonderful son born when I was only 16 years old, and um, and uh, I, I loved him with all my heart, 37, 35 years ago today, so, but I thought it would be, uh, if you, you may not have time to listen to this, and, and yet you may, because you, you ne may have never read my book, Exposed Heart, it's the first book I ever wrote, and, uh, and uh, I, t I share actually in chapter 20, Two Tickets to Paradise. And if you'll just have a minute, because I think everybody should celebrate their loved ones. It wouldn't bother me if, if, if everybody that's lost a loved one, if they have a story. If you don't want to listen to it, you just scroll on by. But the truth is, that child of yours, that loved one of yours, you can, if you want, you can honor them by telling their story. And I just want to tell you, I just felt like that Maybe that's a good thing to do today because somebody might literally be thinking about taking their life. And I would say to you, please listen to me. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. As the sun peeked over the horizon, reality set in. I had, sent, I had spent the night identifying my son's body, contacting relatives and close friends and answering Routine questions posed by the police officer in charge. General procedure, they called it. It was the darkest night of my life back then. Since then, I've had other dark nights, and you do too. We, but you think, well, that's the darkest night of my life. And I'm, I can tell you, that was, that was something. Mike had owned the shotgun for some time. It was one of those long shotguns used for hunting. Charlesy, Charlesy's husband, that's his, Charlesy is his sister, her husband had asked him to go hunting several times, but the trip never seemed to pan out, and Mike didn't know too much about guns, but uh, he wanted to go hunting. He said, and I, I spotted Mike's pickup in the backyard uh, in the driveway, uh, so I knew he was at home. When I set foot in the house, a chill went through my bones. It felt empty. I immediately knew something was wrong, terribly wrong. I rushed to Howard's room. Howard is, was my youngest son, his brother, who passed away 15 months ago. And, uh, and he was 49 years old, but Mike was 27. But Howard was only a young boy at that time, a young teenager. He and a friend were there. And I said, he and a friend were listening to the radio and talking. I said, where's Mike? And he said, I, I don't know. His pickup is in the backyard. Uh, I called out to the back door because Howard had been gone with his friend at his friend's house, and they had just came back. Uh, I called out the back door, Mike, Mike, are you back there? Answer me, I shouted. No answer. I, I just knew there was, I knew, I just knew something was wrong. He had never threatened such a thing. I never even had that thought. But yet I, you have feelings, you just know things. I walked outside. The floodlight was on in the backyard and I saw his body. He was laying there flat on his back, a few feet from the bed of the truck uh, with his arms and his legs just kind of outstretched like he were laying in a bed. His eyes and his mouth were closed as he lay undisturbed on the ground. The cement actually. There was something weird there was something weird. There was nothing weird. There was nothing weird or ugly about the, the way he looked. My first thought, this is so crazy, I thought, is he sleeping? I mean it, it, that's how I relaxed. He looked laying there. 
And then, of course, I knew immediately, no, he's not sleeping. And, and then I felt his skin, and it was cold, but it was cold. It was November 16th, and it was just happened to be a, a cold, colder time that year. Then I saw the gun, and it was pointed towards him, a little shotgun. Oh, God, no, no, I said. One of my first thoughts, God, do you want me to call him back from the dead? I, I mean, I just, I, when I read the Bible, I was, I was one of those people that when you read it, you take it totally literal. And the Lord Jesus said the same power that he had that we would have, and we could speak to death if or sickness and expect something to happen. And that's what I did without even second-guessing it. But I felt the Lord say, no, he's with me. My arms on my legs were trembling as I leaned over his still body. I knelt down and I kissed his forehead as a mother does when saying goodnight to her sleeping child. Through broken sobs, I spoke to my son. Mikey, I said, you're the most wonderful son a mother could ever have had. I would not have changed you for anything. You are the most wonderful boy in the world. I love you. Mike, I love you. I love you. My words trailed off in a weary whisper as I cherished those moments that I spent time with Mike. I literally, I guess I was there several minutes. I knew he was gone. The Lord had already said he's with him. And so I just held him. Then I got up and I uh, called the ambulance. The ambulance and the police arrived and neighbors stood on their front porches looking curiously as the sirens screamed and the lights lit up the quiet suburban sky. It was, God, uh, it was just, a, it was, God gave, gave me this time. It was, it was almost perfect that I could spend, say goodbye to Howard, to Mikey by, by myself. When the coroners arrived, they found one spot of blood under the jacket. One spot of blood under the jacket. The size of the blast should have blown a hole in him. It was a shotgun, and it was shot at such an angle, the, the coroner said, that it hit every major, it just hit the major organ, and it, his blood just stopped. I didn't know that could happen, but that's what he said, and that's why that there was one it was a tiny bit of blood on his inside of his jacket, and one little drop of one little drop of blood, about the size of a nickel, on this on the concrete. It's amazing. Later, I read the coroner's report indicating that a single bullet made a clean, swift shot, hitting several major organs, and that accounted for that small amount of blood. The report said he died instantly, which is why there was no sign of pain or trauma in his body or appearance. Mike's death was ruled as a suicide. There's a lot of people that have lost their children or loved ones, brothers, sisters, friends from suicide. You've maybe even thought about it yourself. The reason I think I want to celebrate Mike's birthday, Not it's really not his birthday, but his birthday in heaven. <laughs> 35 years ago, it's a, when he transitioned into that other world, that beautiful place that the Lord Jesus said he's gone to prepare a place for us. And so and there was a time, you know, I, w I would be so broken. But then not so much as you might think because I always, I knew, I just knew I heard the Lord say he's with me, and I knew my, how Mike's life, he was so, he's so passionate and loved Jesus so much. <laughs> the police, on the other hand, didn't consider this to be an open shut case. There was no suicide note, although that's not unusual. I explained to the police that my son couldn't read. Uh, he could hardly read. He was, he was born with cerebral palsy, He so he had a Learning. He was a slow learner, educable, they called it, but he was very smart. 
and he could do so many things. He had his driver's license. He worked at a job. He he did things, but he was he couldn't read her much, and uh, he couldn't write very well. And so no, he didn't write a note, and he didn't uh, say a thing really. The detectives gathered their information on that terrible night and considered the case open. But I knew in my heart that Mike had taken his life. In retrospect, all the warning signs were there. He had brought his he had brought his tools home from work. Uh, he had not gone to work that day and had made his peace with himself in the world. He never missed work. He wouldn't even take those days that they give you off. He just felt like he just needed to go to work, and he that's the kind of person he was. But because of different things that was going on kind of around him in his life and transitions, hard things, difficult things, he had not gone to work. And the day before, when he had left work, he had take, he had emptied out his locker and taken all his tools and everything. He was a groundskeeper of apartments that were in Arlington, Texas. It had been in Bedford for years and years, but they had moved to Arlington. And uh, see, that was a difficult transition. Difficult. Difficult. And I know it would have been more acceptable to society if Mike had died in an automobile accident. I've gone over that day a million times in my mind. I've asked myself a thousand times if I could have done anything differently. And, you know, that's just what you do. If I had known then what I know now, I maybe have got to try to get him some help for me depression because I saw the depression. I'm not going to read the, the whole chapter. I'm not going to read the whole book. I'm just going to sh share with you this. When I found my son, this is my book. It's available. There's not too many out there. It's a rare book now. Uh, Exposed Heart, Jackie Holland. But when I found Mike, 35 years ago. <laughs> I didn't know the day before or even a few hours before that it would be the last time I would see his face, hug his neck, say, see you in a little while. Mike was my, kind of like my best friend really in a way. I mean, he, and he was a prayer warrior. He was a soul winner. He he would pass out little tracks at the mall, and and just because he couldn't read very well, didn't he didn't let that stop him because he's really a shy, just a lovely person. Everybody loved him. He had a big old briefcase that he would carry, and and he would uh, have those tracks, and he would pass them out to strangers, and people actually would have read it, come up to him, broke down in tears, and cried and asked Jesus in their heart. Now, if you can't believe that, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> then you might not believe anything I'm saying. Why would any mother lie about her child, for goodness sake? I'm just telling you, he was such a wonderful son. But the Lord took him and allowed him to go at 27. You say, well, did God take you? The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but the Lord says, I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. There's so many people that are filled with fear, depression, anger, just sadness, disappointments in life. And they somehow rationalize at times that everybody would be better off without them. I don't know what exactly Mike was thinking, except I I think he was thinking this. That's why I tiled it to Tickets to Paradise, because there was a song out then. He liked it. <laughs> but uh, he knew that there was a paradise with Jesus. He knew God had shown him in, in dreams, and he had described them vividly, how beautiful what the things that he had seen, the, the beautiful, clear water. And, and Jesus just sitting there when he's thrown in that beautiful, clear water and the tree of life and just fruits. He said, you've never seen that? It was so, so beautiful. He could, couldn't hardly tell it. He was so happy when he was dreaming. That was just a few weeks or a month or so before he passed away. But he, Mike had transitioned to a job over in from, from uh 
Bedford to Arlington, and you had to get on the freeway. And in time, always he took this little back route through there, and uh, that's before Arlington had gotten so huge. And uh, and he'd get he'd make his way to his work. Well, at one point in time, I remember this is just a for instance something that you think, well, that's so sad. Yet yeah, this is sad. This is a sad thing. He. It was raining, and, and the, it had flooded all there, and water was up really high, and you couldn't go, you couldn't drive through there. And he had to get on the freeway. Well, Mike was a good driver, excellent driver, never got a ticket, always a good, excellent driver. But he couldn't read the signs. He couldn't figure out the signs at night, you know, which, and to make his way back from where he was at in Arlington back to into the HEB area, he just he got turned around. And he was petrified. And I was too that night. I remember thinking that night, this was just a few weeks before he passed away. And I was thinking, you know, where is he? Where is he? And I was afraid he had a wreck or something. And finally around midnight or something, here he came in and he, he looked terrified. He looked absolutely terrified. Those are things that you don't like to remember. It's almost worse than finding him. Because he had been driving those streets and the world is full of people like this. They've got things going on in their life, hurting, things, hurtful, and people are sometimes so mean and cruel. But he, he, he made his way home. God brought him home. But he had driven for hours in the rain trying to, to make his way back. And when he did, he was so exhausted and it was things like that, and even the the new, um, he, all the years that he had worked at as a groundskeeper and done an excellent job. They absolutely adored him. At uh, I forget the name of the little uh, forget the name of the little apartments there in in Bedford, but anyway, uh, when they moved to those offices in Arlington, this new manager realized that he could not read. And so she demanded that he learn how to read. Well, he, you know, you can't force somebody to learn how to read. <laughs> and she made fun of him and they laughed. And he had all those years, huh, all those years, here he was 27 years old. He graduated from Trinity High School. <laughs> all these years he had managed to be in the world, giving out tracts, working, loving, never miss church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, and any revival that came up. <laughs> and yet here's this one woman, one very cruel, mean woman, who tormented him by saying and laughing to everyone, saying, "You can't read. I can't. You can't work here and not read. How are you going to, you know, take the?" Uh, information to the to the apartment complexes and blah blah blah, and it was just like it was just oh like like he had to in his mind he's thinking I've got to read I've got to read, <laughs> what a what a cruel old woman she was, and uh, and it was just a, a series of, of silly stupid things like that, and uh, in fact I remember when she she actually attended the funeral and the word got back to me that that woman said this. She, you're speaking of me, she must have not loved him much because she didn't even cry. <laughs> Is that the stupidest thing you've ever heard of? I didn't even cry. God was holding back my tears so I didn't just become a basket case. I was, he was allowing me to comfort others as he had, was comforting me. I had my times of crying and sobbing and brokenness, but the Lord had given me a wonderful peace, and I, I remember being able to kind of handle it all. Probably a shock, too. <laughs> it's amazing what you can do. God can get you through it. You don't have the grace to do it today, but you'd have it with, when you need it. And, uh, but that, I mean, that was just, a, that was the kind of person that really drove him into a place that he would want to take his life and not be at that job because that was his whole life was built around that job and everything and and the shame, I'm sure the sh feeling so embarrassed that he that he couldn't read and they and they laughed at him, 
and choked with him. And, he, and it was just terrible. And and around that same time, there was a lady there that had kind of befriended him. I think she was a secretary. And she had befriended him. He was befriended her. And uh, and yet it didn't amount, amount to anything as far as that goes, but they were friends. And uh, I think he probably was felt felt real close to her, but he could see, you know, she was she, she was just a friend, and just being kind to him. Well, oddly enough, you don't believe this, but about a year after he died, I was sitting in my office. I was working at Restoration Church. I was the care ministry pastor there, and I was sitting my in there, and here come a strange woman attractive woman. She said, may I speak with you? I was a friend of Mike's. Well, of course, immediately I just said, I welcomed her in, her in my office and she sat down and she began to share with me things that literally ripped my heart out. She began to share with me. She said, Mike was, Mike and I were friends and I'd, I, they were treating him really bad over there. And she said, I was reaching out to him, but I felt like he got real close to me. And, and she said, he made a, fun, a strange statement one day. He said, I've got two tickets to paradise. She want to go. And she said, no, I can't go. <laughs> but she said, you know, I, did, I, I, I knew they were giving him a really hard time. And he was so sweet. And he was such a wonderful person. So the best, best ever. But she said, I, I knew I couldn't, you know, I just didn't, you know. I'm seeing someone else anyway, but just not interested there. She was a friend, so that she she explained that to me. But she but she said when I heard that Mike had taken, when I knew that he had taken his life after that, she said I just felt so awful because I knew that maybe I was also maybe kind of responsible. And she said, and she said it was just it just hurt her really bad. It may have been two years after she died, maybe one year, I don't know. But anyway, she said uh, she remarried. She married after that, and she married an attorney. I think she said he was in Fort Worth, and he took his life. So here she was telling me this story. I'm just sitting there, a mother with my baby. She's telling me how she... You know, you'd feel like you, well, you should have been nicer to him. I hope you let him down gently or something. And uh, and then as then she, then her husband took his life, and I'm thinking, what in the world? And anyway, I was very nice to her, but I was just I was just crushed by it. There's some things sometimes after deaths you hear about somebody you can't take it to heart. You can't go there. You can't hold it against them. You got to go forward. You can't t bring the past into your now. You've got to let it go. You've got to let it go. There's others around that need you. You've got to go forward. Mike always, he, he, he was very close to my dad. And, and they talked about heaven all the time. Daddy always loved to talk about heaven, what it's going to be like. It was just wonderful. And I know so many times that I would drive up and Mike would be sitting outside. He loved me. He was an outside person. He loved it. And he would be looking up at the stars. He said, do you think Jesus is coming back today? And I said, I don't know. It might be. You know, that was in 89. And I said, he, he sure might, Mikey. And that would be the conversation. So I know he knew that if he was out of here, he would be with the Lord. Because he, 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 he had all that confidence that, about his salvation. He wasn't worried about that. But the night that that he passed away. I was going to like a choir practice thing and it was going to be for like a little uh, cantata thing <laughs> for, for Thanksgiving at the church. And so before I left, I, you know, I told him goodbye and uh, I see him in a little while and I said, why don't you go over at Mother and Daddy's? They just lived over there in Colleyville. And I said, why don't you go over to Mother Daddy's and, and get you something to eat? He said, yeah, I will. And so uh, anyway, he smiled, we waved goodbye, and that was it. And you see, the next time I found him, he was gone. He was, he was cold. But I knew he was with the Lord, and the Lord said he's with me. And I've never, I've never, ever worried that he wasn't because I know he's alive. I know how much he loved the Lord. 
maybe the, one of the best Christians I ever met, that's for sure. But people can be very cruel. Life can be very hard. Times can throw you some punches that you, you, you can't know how to deal with. Nobody to talk to. Howard, uh, Howard, see, I, Howard is my youngest son, his brother. Well, he just said, I told you, he died 15 months ago. He's so fresh on my mind to losing Howard. But this is Mikey's day. This is Mike's day. This is third, this is what I'm I'm celebrating his him being with Jesus for 35 years today, not Howard, because I know Howard's with Jesus too, but he's just been gone 15 months. But Hi, Mikey has been gone 35 years, so for 35 years we've all the whole family has missed him, and God gave me that comfort to comfort others because my entire family, including cousins relatives, friends, everybody was just so brokenhearted and asking questions like, why? Why Mike? He was the best person who ever knew. Why? And they, they were brokenhearted. But I was able, because God gave me that good peace, to be able to comfort them. And that's what he will do. He will give you comfort. The comforter is the Holy Spirit. And when you're a Christian, when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not by yourself. Jesus came into the world to pay for the sin, our sins. Mikey had received Jesus as his Lord and Savior, so his sins were forgiven. He, he, he wasn't living in sin. He was, he was ready. He, he, he may have got it a, a little ahead of time, but it's like, you know, I, I, all I can go on is what, I know his life, and I know what the Lord said. He's with me, and even asked me that question. Would you have felt better had it been an accident or somebody shot him or something tragic like that? And I could only say no. No, he did it on his own terms, the way he felt like, I guess, the Lord was right there with him. And the very fact that that shotgun went into his body and did not rip him to shreds that I would have to see. I didn't see anything awful. He was beautiful, so much so. Remember, I said to myself, is he sleeping? Which would have been insane. But you are kind of insane when things happen sometimes. But I write about it. You, you can get this book on Kindle. I've got it for 99 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Exposed Heart, Jackie Holland, Tamara Vines, uh, Dollar helped me with it at the time, and um, and she's a in the family relative. Actually, her her daughter married my grandson, and that was a an interesting twist just in itself when we were writing this book. But never, never in my right mind did I think I could make it through. 35 years and be able to sit here and tell you this. And now I have other son, my, my youngest son is with the Lord. And I have a daughter, Chelsea. She's, she's still here. And I pray that, I pray that she'll outlive me. Nobody want, no, no parent wants to bury their kids. Nobody wants to bury anybody. We don't want to get that phone call in the night to say, sit down, I've got something to tell you. We don't want to hear bad news. We want everybody to live forever. But the truth is, you will live forever, but you will live forever with the Lord or without the Lord. Now, in my opinion, I believe as long as there is a breath in your body, you can, you may not even have to say anything, but you can with your mind, ask the Lord Jesus to forgive you of your sins and, and say, I believe in Jesus. You can say it. And nobody knows who goes to heaven. We won't know until we get there. We can know based on people's lives, their testimony, and various things like that, but we don't really know. So if you don't know the Lord today and you say, I need to get right with God because this could happen to me or my kids and I'm not ready for this, ask Jesus. 
Well, you know, let's, pray, let's say a prayer. You've got to believe that Jesus came to the world to seek and save the lost. So he came to pay the price of our sin because we've all sinned. And he paid with his own blood. They pierced his side and nailed his hands into the cross and his feet. They beat him and he was, he's God in the flesh. Came here for this very reason, to, to pay for our sins. He, he, he wanted to pardon you, pardon me of our sins. There's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing too great. There's no sin that he can't forgive. And I guess the unpardonable sin is when you just totally reject him and just, or make fun of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said when after he died, he died, was dead for three days, then he raised up and he appeared to many. And, uh, and, uh, and then he told them, he said, I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and, and where I am, I'll come again, and I'll receive you to myself. And so they, they were just standing there looking. And then some angels appeared and said, why are, why, are you, why are you being so sad? You know, he's coming back. And basically, the Holy Spirit is with you. He already told you that. The Holy Spirit will will come upon you and you will you will he will lead you and guide you into all truth so the holy spirit is in you and that's why the holy spirit seemed, helped me to get through my hard times and that's what i am sharing with you today because i was trying to think how can i share about mike how beautiful i'll post some pictures in a little while but um he's just a wonderful son beautiful he's a really handsome son i thought he kind of looked like clint eastwood uh he's tall and and slightly thick curly hair, so you know, kind of curly, like just like Clint Eastwood, about like Rowdy Yates. <laughs> and I remember that so well. But anyway, let's ask Jesus to, to come in her heart. I'm ready to meet the Lord. I want you to be too. Let's say this prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I believe you paid for my sins on the cross. And I thank you. I thank you so much. I don't deserve it, but I thank you. Forgive me. I'm sorry for my sins. Help me to live for you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. And let me spend the rest of my life loving you and learning more about you and following you and not being ashamed of you. That I know when I die and I close my eyes in death that nobody's going to have to say, where is she or where is he? They're going to say, I, I know how they felt about the Lord. I know their, their heart. But even if you don't know, remember this. There's, it just takes a moment to go out of this world, but it takes a moment to just believe. Because the whole thing is, Jesus said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Believe. you got to believe first. Believe. Believe you're a sinner. Believe he paid for your sins and accept him and receive him and say you're sorry for your sins. That's it. So you did that. I want to hear from you. Tell somebody. Uh, this was not certainly not meant to be a downer. I, I, I'll, I'll see my son again. Now I'm glad they're both together <laughs> with my mother and my daddy and my grandparents and different ones, my friends. It's different ones. A lot of people at my age, I mean, they're, they're going. And I'm seeing them. I'm like, bye. I'll see you later. Yeah, one day they'll be saying that about me. They'll say, see you, Jackie. <laughs> God's kept me for such a time as this. I love you. The ministry is Whosoever Will Outreach Ministries. You can go to my website, Whosoever Will Outreach Ministries, all of them together, Whosoever Will Outreach Ministries.org. And, uh, or you can go to the YouTube uh, page, and it's Jackie Holland, J-A-C-K-I-E Holland, at Jackie Holland 444, and send me a little note. But if not, tell somebody, because that's all, that's all that matters. I love you, and, I, and uh, we're celebrating. I'm celebrating my son, Michael David Phipps, 35 years, gone today to be with the Lord. And I will see him again, and I'm excited about that. God bless you. And uh, you keep the faith, be strong, and you shall do exploits, okay? God bless you.